Hey folks, welcome to this brand new episode of the MMA Formula podcast. Now, it's been a while, I know, guys, I've been incredibly busy, don't remember, but uh, I told you a while, a while ago, but I am self-employed, running more than one business by myself, so sometimes some things have to give, and in this case, that was MMA. Um, things have calmed down a little bit, so I wanted to do this episode right now about Francis Ngannou fighting Cyril Gann, which was a fight um, pretty much everybody was looking forward to, including me. And then we're going to do the MMA Formula End of the Year Awards uh, that I did last year as well. If you remember those, I do things a little bit differently than many of the award shows that, uh, that are out there. So you have that to look forward to. Now, before we start, as always, you can support the podcast and my work by... Uh, mostly sharing this episode far and wide with folks who enjoy this content. Uh, you obviously like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And uh, if you want to do more, check out the Patreon. The, the link to that will be in the description of this episode. And um, there you can find some content that is unique that we don't, don't share anywhere else. And obviously, you know, that helps out a lot with, with uh, you know, pay, Paying, paying for the costs of hosting the website, hosting the podcast, and so much more. So, let's get right to it. Critical part about the Francis Ngannou Cyril Gan fight was expectations. Now, I posted on my Facebook uh, page about this before the fight. <coughs> Apologies. Um, I, I had it slightly in favor of Gan. Because he is the more the more technical striker, and I thought he would fight maybe a little bit more like he used to. Whereas the biggest question for me was what was Francis going to do? Because he made a lot of progress in his previous fight against Stipe compared to the one before that. He looked much more technical, much better rounded, and uh, I, he, obviously he still has that devastating power. So I was looking forward to a really good fight, at the very least an intense one. I didn't expect it to go the distance like it did, but we'll get to that. Now, as for Gan, obviously, they know each other. They've trained together, sparred, and so on. Um, so I, I, I was assuming that Cyril would be prepared for the fight. Now, what did we see in the fight? We saw mainly Gan fighting a lot less fluid than, than he normally would. He was a lot more tense. Uh, he seemed to be a lot more nervous, in my opinion, and unwilling to commit to techniques in, in many cases. So I was a bit disappointed in that. I thought he was going to go for it more. And in particular, in that last round, when his teacher said that, literally, uh, he said, you know, on perd le combat, we're losing the fight. Um, you got to go for it. And Cyril didn't really do that. So that was one thing uh, I think is where he really lost the fight. And then we had that just incredibly disastrous decision to go for that leg lock that he did and, and, and got nowhere. If he would have, would have avoided that and just get Francis to the ground, which he was doing a really good job of getting there, and then get, get on top and just tire him, tire him out because he was tired. And just blast him with with short shots and punches, and and maybe a submission would have presented itself, but at the very least he would have been dominant in that round, and um, would have, that have been enough to score the victory? Not sure, but it would have gotten him a lot closer than what he did now. So extremely disappointed in Gan. He has obviously a lot of potential. He has a potential to beat Francis. That is clear. Um, but he, it just didn't came out, come out. And in my opinion, he was too shy, too much holding back, unwilling to commit to punches and kicks, um, and by far not his usual, you know, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee self that we've seen him do so excellently in his previous fights. Now, it's not surprising in a sense that Everybody's afraid of Francis's power, and, and Gan is no different. So I think in that regard, you know, him being careful is, is only natural. But at a certain point, you just have to go for it. You have to dethrone the champion. 
you have to prove that you're beating him as opposed to just you know racking up points and hopefully having enough of them to to win the fight it's typically not how it goes you have to show that you're better than the, than the champion and fighting timidly doesn't get you there so that was uh i think where Cyril kind of made a mistake and maybe didn't really feel confident enough to take it to Francis in a more consistent manner. Yeah, you know, that's a little bit sad, but, you know, it is what it is. Now, as far as Francis, apparently he fucked up his knee, like, real bad, like, destroyed, I think it was his ACL, I'm not quite sure, but extensive knee damage. So he was not his usual self. He was not his best self. Despite that, we saw him basically pick up Cyril and and toss him around like a rag doll. Uh, I wouldn't say at will, but, you know, consistently. Gan had, if I'm not mistaken, never been uh, taken down in the UFC. So um, it, it, this is testament to, to the progress that Francis has made. So I'm very impressed with Francis in, in that despite the injury, he could still keep going and, and stay composed. He did not revert to just going, going apeshit and swinging at Cyril which is what a lot of people expected him to do once he got tired, just you know, lose his composure and start brawling. It didn't. So that shows a lot of maturity that he, that he seems to be getting as a, as a fighter. So what I would like, let's run it back. Let's do it again. Let's fix Francis's knee, um, make sure that, that he has time to recover, to train, and then just do it again. Who else are they going to give it to? Not quite sure. Not quite sure. Um, you know, we can, we can argue about it, but I, I, I would love to see a rematch. I'm pretty sure that Gan would uh, go back to square one, talk with his trainer, and just learn from this experience and, and, and get better. It's the first time in the UFC that he's basically uh, just been outclassed. And my gut feeling says that he would, would actually do better in a, in a second fight. And Francis, obviously, as well, because he, uh, he, he will have healed up his knees normally completely and be in much better shape, be much more aggressive and dangerous and so on. So what's not to love about a fight like that? Now, and, and that is despite all the shenanigans that we can expect with contract negotiations going on right now. That, that is all a bunch of nonsense that, that is always happening uh, when it comes to the UFC. Um, this is just one of the things that I loathe about the sport is this, all this drama about contracts and refusing to fight for less money and this focus on money. I get it. It's, uh, for me, you know, anybody who steps into the combat arena, whether it's mats, a ring or a cage, I don't care, pay these people because they have short careers and they end up messed up at the end of them. So... Uh, I mean, I, has, I still have tons of injuries and, and, and you know, the, 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 the aftermath of uh, having competed in, in, the, in the past. And yeah, I can tell you guys, you're not young forever and you need to get that stuff fixed. You need to get new knees, you need to have surgeries, you need to have rehab, all that kind of stuff. And it gets to be expensive, in particular when you, you fight at the highest levels. So, you know... You're going to have used up your body by the time you're 40. Um, there better be something to show for it. And, I, and I'll get back to this when I get to the, the awards um, that, I'll, that I'll mention later. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, I was hoping for Gan to actually beat Francis in stand-up and basically show like, okay, this is how you fight a big, strong guy just by being more technical. Uh, we've seen this many times before in the lighter weight classes. And I was hoping that this could be basically uh, a resurgence of, of uh, the, the heavyweight division where we see a lot more technical striking and, and higher quality striking. And a lot of people get upset with me when I say that. And I'm like, dude, I mean, um, watch guys like Rico Verhoeven, who is just as big and strong as these guys, but has excellent stand-up technique, fluid striking, footwork, etc., 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 and so on. Yes, yes, adapt. You, you have to adapt it for MMA. Of course, I know that. That's not the point. The point is that big guys can actually move well. There's no reason why they can't. Problem is that most heavyweights still rely on their power uh, to get things done. And it works, but, you know, that's why the heavyweight division is often not as spectacular or as good as it could be. 
Right. So that that was um, the first thing that I wanted to mention. Um, let's move on now to the da -da -da -da, MMA Formula Year Awards. And the first one, the first award is the Best Post Fight Comment Awards. We have a tie. The first one is for Marvin Vettori after the fight with Paula Costa. There was a lot of animosity between these guys. Awesome fight. I mean, those body kicks that Costa did to, to Vettori, it, it was like impressive that Marvin was still standing. I really enjoyed the fight. And Marvin, just at the end of it, you know, I think it was something that they asked him like uh, in the, after the fight. Like, hey, so what do you think uh, uh, about Paulo, Paulo now? And it's like, he's a cunt. <laughs> I laughed my ass off with that one. So, so that was great. Um, great fight, in my opinion. Lived up to the hype completely and a lot of fun. Wouldn't mind seeing a rematch, uh, seeing the, these guys go at it. Pretty sure that Paulo is going to get the message that, dude, you're going to move up in weight class because you're, you're, you're not making the scales anymore. So uh, he, says, he says he wants to main, stay in the same category, but... I think the UFC is going to say, like, dude, <laughs> enough of that. You know, we can't count on you to make weight, so you're going to move up. But we'll see what happens with that. But there is a tie here for the category of best post fight comments. And that one uh, is the Conor McGregor Dustin Poirier fight when Dustin got booed after the fight. And he basically said, All the people booing, you can kiss my whole asshole. <laughs> I had not heard that expression before. And it came out so from the heart from Dustin. It was like that, that, that was really a heartfelt, fully meant comment uh, right at, the, uh, at all the haters out there. And um, I really enjoyed that as well. Obviously, the fight was controversial with the leg break and, and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, there, there's also Connor's behavior after that fight, uh, you know, going the, the comment about Dustin's wife. All that kind of stuff. I'm like, dude, I mean, you're losing it. Um, the era of the invincible Conor McGregor is long gone. You might want to think about your legacy, if that interests you at all. Uh, and if not, you know, stop fighting. It's, it's, it's fine. You did enough. Great fighter, amazing, amazing fighter. But, you know, all, all the trash talking. I, th I think it's gotten to the point where it's no longer funny. McGregor used to be hilarious with his trash talking. Now it's just nasty. So, you know, props to Dustin in uh, the tie here for best post fight comment of 2021. Now we get to the biggest loser of the year, and that sadly is uh, once again going to be John Jones. Why? Well, there's several, several reasons why. Uh, one of the main reasons is that we've consistently seen John Jones fuck up. I mean, I'm going over his Wikipedia page, and for the guys listening to this, I'm um, I'm doing something new on on the YouTube channel where I post the podcast. Uh, you, I'm also you know doing this with a with a webcam where you can see me in the corner, and I'm showing websites with a bunch of stuff here. I'm here at the Wik John Jones's Wikipedia page. Um, Controversies, eye pokes, Daniel Cormier altercation, hit and run conviction, domestic violence arrest is now added to that list. Um, not even talking about, uh, you know, forbidden substances uh, and his abuse problem. I mean, September 24, 21, uh, police were called at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas responding to a domestic incident. Didn't really go far. Um, it, Either there were no charges or his wife dropped the charges or refused to press charges. I just remember. Point is this. That happens. So apparently, you know, his wife gets gets out uh, and, and um, you know, out of the room or whatever. And the reports that I read is that she, she looked very scared. So the cops obviously came over to arrest or, or handle whatever was going on with John. Um, and there's actually a video of John talking to the cops. I mean, he's surrounded by a bunch of police officers and he's going like, I bet I could take you guys. And, and they say, John, please don't do it. Uh, I mean, this guy has been given chance after chance after chance and he keeps fucking it up. And he's a great fighter. That's not the issue. It's just that, dude, you've got everything going for you. 
and 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 after you get arrested the police are called whatever happened with your wife nobody who wasn't there uh can say something about it because we don't know uh, we weren't there there's no recordings that i know of or whatever and she his wife is clearly not you know willing to press charges fine that's i mean that's their business but the point is this you didn't have to be a dick towards the police there was no need for that given your track record i mean it's that that's for me the reason why he's the biggest loser of the, of, of the year so and we'll see if he ever fights again. At this point, I have my doubts that John Jones will actually fight in a, at, at heavyweight because it, there's really no in the near future no fight happening so far as I, as, I, as that I know of. So you know, when's the last time he fought? Let's take a quick look. Uh, Dominic Reyes, February eighth, two thousand twenty. So almost two years ago that he fought. And before that, he fought July 2019, March 2019, December 2018. So that's not a lot of fights, man. <laughs> that's not a lot of fights. So John, I would really wish that he would get his act together and start fighting and stop with all the nonsense. Right. Moving on to the stupid move of the year. There were a lot of stupid moves to choose from. Uh, in this case, I'm going to give it to Michael Chandler when he fought Justin Gaethje. So they're both what I call bangers. They they just like to bang and, and just brawl. Now, Justin has gotten a lot smarter over the years. Um, if you, if you uh, watch his career, you've seen that in his last couple of fights, he was more and more tactical and smarter and not just bite down on his mouthpiece. And... Um, and go after his opponents or just stand toe to toe and and and, and brawl it out he's getting much much uh better at, at just being very technical very tactical he stayed composed mostly in that fight whereas chandler did a lot of showboating a lot of very well you know useless um mental games with justin dropping his guard stepping forward like that you know Puffing out his chest, getting getting punched in the face for it, and then doing it again, and it doesn't impress anybody. Michael should know better. He's a, he's a good fighter. He's got a lot of experience. He he should know better than that. After the fight, he admitted to it. I saw a video of him talking about the fight and saying like, "Yeah, I was stupid. I shouldn't have done that." So that was that was a stupid move. Chandler could be in a different position right now. And, and now it's Gaethje who's going after Oliveira next, uh, if I'm not mistaken. That's what the last thing I heard. So um, that was a stupid move, Michael. Uh, I really hope that he can recover. Uh, I would love to see him fight Oliveira again. Because people forget that in that first round, Oliveira was hurting. He was almost out. And uh, sure, he knocked out Chandler in the second round. In that first round, he was getting beaten up pretty bad. So a rematch, again, as a fan of the sport, you should want to see that rematch. Now, I'm, uh, I'm going to watch, obviously, the fight with Gaethje and Oliveira. That's going to be awesome, too. But, you know, Chandler deserves another shot at Oliveira, in my opinion. But then you better stop doing stupid shit like the way he fought Justin, especially in the later rounds. That was just stupid. All right. Sorry, Mike. Still love you, but that was dumb. Okay, next we get the awesome move of the year. And I have to give it to Chris Barnett at UFC 268 with his spinning wheel kick that landed. Uh, the guy can do front flips uh, and, and he does this, does this insane stuff. Being a heavyweight who's clearly pretty, very overweight as well. He, is no, he doesn't have the body of a Greek god. He is no Apollo. He's no Adonis. Um, the guy's a little bit chubby, but look at him go. I mean, that wheel kick was, for a guy his size, that was very impressive. So I, th I think it's an awesome move. Why? There's a lot of awesome moves, but it's mo more from people you would expect it. And from Chris, Chris Barnett, it's more like <laughs> a lot of people didn't see that coming. And they were like, okay, that guy's got some moves. <laughs> so congrats to him. Um, and that that is just... I just enjoy watching just this big guy doing these uh, these athletic things. It's just just a lot of fun when when you watch them just go at it like that and 
and, and basically impress everybody I'm like, whoa, I didn't know that big guy can do that. I'm a heavyweight. I know big guys can do that, but a lot of people, you know, casual fans, um, they, they don't do that. And this gives me a little bit of hope for the heavyweight division that maybe if other heavyweights can see that, okay, despite being a big guy, you can actually pull off a spinning back kick uh, uh, or spinning heel kick, ball heel kick, whatever you want to call it. You can pull that off and, and, and you know, kick people's heads almost into orbit. Okay, maybe I can do that too. And that the whole heavyweight division can just, you know, get to be a little bit better. So, um, we're going to the next award, and that is the I Told You So Award, which I'm going to give to Khalil Roundtree in his fight against uh, Modestas Bukowskas. Um, you can see the sidekick slash stomp kick that I did uh, on the YouTube channel as I'm talking about this. So he was um, all of a sudden just slamming that sidekick into the knee and, and it just tore through. I mean, it broke uh, Bukowska's uh, knee into a bunch of little pieces and it, it's all messed up. Now, Bukowska's afterwards, he said like, you know, fair, fair game. I mean, it's, it's my problem. I should have defended against that. So all the people complaining, should this technique be outlawed or, um, or banned from the sport? I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I mean, there, if you ban that one, there's so much more you should ban. It, it, there's a lot more that you should ban. So, so this here, yeah, it, it, uh, I don't get it. Now, why is this the I told you so? The, the I told you so is because this is a very uh, old technique coming from traditional martial arts that you rarely see done in this fashion. I repeat, in this fashion, the way that Roundtree did it something that you didn't see all that much um, before um, this fight happened. Yes, people did side kicks. I know John Jones did a lot of low side kicks as well, but not like this. And this gets seem to be um, a, a, a very technical discussion where it's actually not necessarily a, a full-on low side kick, but it is something between a side kick, storm kick, and a bronco kick, which you can look up if you don't know what that is, um, that... It's kind of this blend between all these things, and that's what Roundtree does. So I've been saying for years that you will see more and more inspiration from traditional martial arts in modern mixed martial arts competitions. Why? Because everybody wants an edge, and they have they're going to look for something that they haven't done before. And it's going to, where where is it going to come from? From you know the the movement expert, the touch bud guys, the, like Nate Diaz call call them, um, yeah. Okay, so those guys. So where is the the movement teacher from Conor McGregor? Is he still in his camp? No, it isn't. No, he's not. So where are all the other movement guys in in MMA camps? Nowhere to be seen. How is that? Well, maybe it wasn't really about movement at all to get better. So anyway, leaving at that, that was the, I told you so. And then we get to the what the fuck of the year. And that's mullets. If you're listening to this, I am showing a picture of uh, Jimmy Crute in, in all his glorious presence with that kind of weird haircut that is, I'm, I'm calling it a mullet, but because I'm not quite sure what it is. Got hair on top. This... <laughs> This kind of carpet hanging from the back of his head. Uh, the sides of his head are, are shaven off a little bit. And I mean, Jimmy was, in my opinion, uh, flying that flag the most. But there were a bunch of other fighters this year who were also sporting this, this mullet hairdo that I, I have no idea where that comes from. Guys, I mean, you could say the 80s, maybe even, even in the 90s, there were some mullets. But please, I mean, it's 2021. Don't do that anymore. Just shave it off if you like. Be creative that way. But this is not a good look for an MMA fighter. <laughs> not at all. So I was like, what the fuck is going on? There was this one event, and I think it's it's the one where Jimmy fought last, uh, where a bunch of fighters had these, had these, these uh, haircuts. And I was like, what's going on? I asked my kids who are, you know, young adults. I said, is, is this a thing? And they said, no, no, no. <laughs> Over here with our friends, nobody has his hair like that. But apparently, in MMA circles, it seems to be a thing. But I was like, "What the fuck's going on here? This is so uh, this is so out there." 
which means that I'm getting old, but I digress. All right, so that was about what the fuck of the year. And now we move to the two awards that most people want to talk about, and that is Knockout of the Year and Best Fight. So Knockout of the Year for me was Rose Namayunas knocking out uh, Zhang Weili. And why? Because it was clear. There is no argument to say, well, it was a fluke. No. She knocked her out. And if you watch it in slow motion from different angles, like I have, then you will see that Rose kind of feints a low kick. And it, it makes it look like she's going to throw a low kick, but then immediately makes it into that high kick. You can see Wei Li react to the initial movement by making a defensive move against a low kick. And she doesn't spot that it's a setup. She doesn't spot that it's going to go high. And it lands perfectly. And Wei Li, is, she's down. The fight was stopped rightfully, in my opinion. She it's just a flash knockdown. It happens. Uh, from her perspective, probably, she didn't even know that she was knocked down. Uh, it's just that and this is, flash knockdowns are weird. You're fighting, you're standing, and next thing you know, you're lying on the ground, and and you just you, you want to keep going, but there's like this fraction of a second or a second or maybe two that you're missing. But it doesn't feel like you got knocked out that you're coming to. So it's very strange if you haven't experienced this before. But uh, that's what happened. Wei Li was uh, complaining a little bit after the fight, but I mean anybody who watches that footage will see that there's just no argument. She got knocked the fuck out. Um, would love to see that fight again because it was very early on in the fight. So we didn't get the, the huge fight that we were hoping for. But that was a beautiful knockout um, and, and just so well set up. And, and technique landed perfectly and Rose followed up and, and that was great. So that's knockout of the year. And then we get... To the best fight for best fight, I have a tie, and um, the first one is not going to surprise people. The, the 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 second one maybe it will, but I'll explain. So best fight of the year, 2021, um, Max Holloway versus Calvin Cater. Many reasons. Um, Calvin's a good fighter. He's known for his boxing, especially his, his jab and his cross, right? We, everybody knows that. Uh, Max is also a great fighter. He, you know, he, he was doing okay the last few fights, but nothing really all that spectacular, in my opinion. But in this fight against Cater, what, what you saw was, was him just going after um, Cater in a way that you're like, what the hell is going on here? He was boxing up his face like nobody's business. And you can watch the, the, the post-fight pictures of Cater's face. He was just one bloody mess. Now, the really good thing about it is that Calvin kept coming forward and trying to, to get to Max. I mean, the guy's got the heart of a lion. It was an awesome fight. He kept on trying. There's this, there's this, um, this phase, I think it's in the third round, I'm not quite sure, after Max has already demonstrated an output of punches like in, in, in the hundreds per round where it's like a 30 second period in the, in the, in the fight. I th again, I think it's the third round. 30 seconds of Max just non-stop landing punches. It just doesn't stop. It's one after the other. Calvin tries to get away. Max follows and keeps ripping him to the head, to the body. It just doesn't stop. That was impressive as hell. It, it's uh, the closest we've come to that was maybe uh, Nick Diaz, who, for instance, in his fight against Robbie Lawler and, and other fights where you just would keep on punching. But I think that Max, you know, was even better at it in, in his fight against Skater with just, just technical way that he, that he would fight, the footwork, the versatility the, in, in his techniques and, and so on, the, the combinations. I mean, that was, that was really impressive. And, and I have pulled the article up here and it, he threw 744 shots at Cater. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. That, that, that is actually the record of most punches thrown in a fight. So, awesome fight. Um, it was great to see Calvin try to always, you know, come back. And despite getting 
basically his, his, his face punched in, he, he managed to uh, really keep going. And, and that takes a tremendous amount of courage and, and perseverance because it, it's one thing if you take a punch, it's something else if you take a bunch of them. But it's dimensions more difficult. I mean, dimensions apart from, from a situation in which you just get beat up for round after round after round and you got to keep going. So in that regard, you know, kudos to, to Calvin. Great performance by Max. In particular, that part where I think it was DC who said something about, you know, best boxer in the UFC. And Max, while he's fighting, says, I am the best boxer in the UFC. As he's looking at the commentators sitting uh, at, at the side of the, of, the, of the cage, as Calvin tries to throw a punch, Max evades that while he's looking away and talking to, uh, to DC, I think. So that was that was that was awesome. This is like you know next level shit and and movie type shit. So well done, Max. Well done, Calvin. Um, great, great fight. Well deserved fight of the year. However, there's a runner up, and um, for me that was a Sean O'Malley Chris Moutinho fight. Now why? Um, okay, so so O'Malley is you know a rising star, but look 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 at. Chris Moutinho, he's 29, uh, has a record here, nine wins, five losses. That's not that great. At 29, you, you have 14 fights and you lost about, you know, five of them. Got knocked out three times, submitted two times. That's not very good. So... At that age, I think it's safe to say that Moutinho, with this track record, uh, is not going to get far in his, in his career anymore. And I, and I wish him all the best, but, but I think realistically speaking, if it hasn't happened by that time, um, I don't think it's going to happen. He's at bantam weight. It's not that there's nobody there to, to beat. So, you know, it's not boding well for him. And in the fight with, Matt, with um, Sean, he was eating punches and kicks. I mean, he was getting beat up and the guy kept coming forward trying to get Sean O'Malley. A lot of respect for that. I mean, he lost a lot of brain cells staying in the fight. And it was late in the third round after getting beaten up for, you know, two and a half rounds straight where the ref eventually stepped in as he was just no longer defending, eating punches one after the other. And it was, I mean, it was pointless at that stage. He, the chances of him knocking out Sean, which is what he needed to do to win the fight, were close to nil, as close as you can get them. Because O'Malley was still, I mean, very much in the fight, focused, not, you know, exhausted or anything. He was just boxing up Chris really, really bad, especially at the, before the ref stepped in. So, this is a shout out to Chris Moutinho. Uh, guys, if you can, give him some love on, on social media. Support that guy. Because this is the kind of fight that takes years of your career. I mean, the best thing Chris can do is not fight for at least a year to let his brain recover. We now know that every single punch you take damages your brain. He took a lot of punches. And he showed tremendous heart. Tremendous heart. He was supposed to be a fall guy. He was supposed to get beat up by, uh, by Sean and, and, and end up knocked out in the first round. Uh, that's what people were saying, and and he just showed that you know screw that. It's kind of like a, a, a Rocky Balboa, Apollo Creed, Rocky One uh, type deal, which is this tremendous underdog fighting this flashy fighter who is so much better than him, and he just keeps going. He, he doesn't. There's no quitting the guy. And, and I'll leave you guys with this this picture here of uh, Chris after the fight, just eating this. Uh, I think he's eating a sandwich or. The, they said it's an ice cream sandwich. I don't know. The guy's just, I mean, his face is punched in and just sitting there eating eating a little bit and trying to probably get rid of the scrambled noises uh, going on in his head after he, having his brains rattled in, in his skull so much for, for minutes on end. Um, just a guy, you know, living his dream. So it's like I said, if, if you can give him some love on social media, that would be great because I, I think the guy deserves it. He deserves support. After showing that that amount of heart, I mean, he definitely definitely deserves our support. Well, that's it, guys. 
hope you enjoyed this podcast i'm gonna call it uh, a wrap and uh, again share like hit the subscribe button hit it really hard with a nice overhand right uh, make sure you get the notification bell if you're watching on youtube share this far and wide that helps out a lot and i'll talk to you guys next time bye